Hey everyone, welcome. Um, people are going to be watching this later going, what is what that guy? So I got a poll here. Um, now I just listed some of the most common ones. Uh, and so I'm curious, what uh, what edit, what's your default go-to editor right now? And the race is off. VS Code's up, oh, nope, site's coming back. Oh, VS Code, oh, Studio's up in there. I can't vote. I'd put Studio, but I can't vote. Nope, Apple's Boss has got some. Code Quick Tester. It's like VS Code is actually doing pretty well. It's amazing. But I think it's because, you know, this, this day was planned around people who aren't necessarily new to AutoHotKey, right? And it is where um, VS Code shines is doing with more advanced stuff. Uh, Cypher Auto Hotkey is still See, amazing. I, I am with, with Enrique. I would use Vim. <laughs> that is a very old editor. Uh, the Linux days, and um, I, I still have, you know, like the key bindings for <laughs> Vim in, <laughs> in uh, VS Code. So, yeah. Actually, look at that. Cypher Auto Hotkey is still there. It's a solid editor. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's my favorite of if I'm introducing someone to Auto Hotkey, I uh, you know, I, I think it's a great one um to just it installs really well. The the help is super helpful. What actually and I don't remember someone answered this earlier. Years ago, I wrote, I think it was Finks, right? That that created the version. Yeah, 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 and yeah. I was I was diving into why, like when studio, I could tell where in the a function in what parameter I was in and the syntax, the highlighting was assisting me to know where I was. And with site fraud hotkey, I couldn't do that. And then I realized it was because of, at least with, with site fraud hotkey and how the, you know, commands, sorry, yeah, commands versus functions that the language didn't allow for it. Um, but I'm wondering in version two, it should be able to handle that. And I, I'm hoping that the the V2, you know, site fraud hockey gets updated one yeah. to the new, to the new, is it DLL? Is that what they're getting <laughs> updated to? Yeah, so that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to update the scintilla component, which is the one that does the highlighting. Um, but the problem with that is that there is no lexer done. I I created a lexer a while ago, but it was just for our hockey version. Yes. Yeah. Walk us through real quickly, because it was a fun conversation where I think you just showed me. I don't think we recorded the video. What is the the Lexer? What's IntelliSense? What is um, the third one of the Auto Assist? Right. right. <laughs> okay. So, um, show Lex show it. Yeah, I'm gonna do it right. It'll now. be easier to, to make sure we're all on the same page. Right. So there's a few sections when 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 you are in an editor, there's something that creates color depending on what you type, and not only that, it also can detect context or assist you in other things. Now, if you have a variable that is gonna be set up, it's gonna give you a specific color. If it is a function or method, it would give you a different color. That's what the lexer does. But actually, the, it's part of what the lexer does. The lexer, what it does is that it grabs each word and assigns it a meaning. So this, is, the meaning of that is that it is a function. Um, the meaning of that is that it is a variable. And then after it assigns meaning to each of the words, then it goes ahead and assigns a color depending on it. But it, that's not its only job. Usually the Lexus right now comes with two things. One of them is the autocomplete. Autocomplete is just this list that you see here that allows you to just pick one of the options. Usually the first one is the one that you want to type anyways. And if you hit tab, it automatically completes the command for you, which is great. That's the part that um, allows you to type very quickly, regex replace, and there you go. I don't have to actually, or regex match, I don't have to type the whole thing. I just type part of it and it allows me to just go ahead and do this. Um, as a bonus, this particular lexer adds the options like this. I don't really like it because now you have to go option by option and then hit tab to go to the next one. But sometimes you just want the last option and I don't have, I have to jump around them and delete yeah. stuff like that, you know, like, huh, dude. Okay, that's not an issue, but 
the last part that it has is what we call IntelliSense, which is when you have the, um, the mouse, you hover the mouse over it, it gives you a quick overview of the options and it gives you some description. Now, what happens is this lecture for version one is not really good. So it is very limited in the sense because if I'm in the options right here, it doesn't tell me that I'm in the options or anything like that. Now let's go to the version two. And basically that's one of the reasons why I'm actually switching a lot to version two. If I type my message box, notice that it didn't give me anything, but as soon as I start typing, right? And I put a comma here, the IntelliSense comes in and it actually not only tells me where I'm at, where I'm at it tells me that I'm in the title, in the, in the title um, op, uh, parameter, but also gives me what I can type in there. I could use the words, yes, no, cancel. I could use something. So it actually not only helps me type, it also helps me not have to go to the um, help file any longer. And, and actually, if I jump to the other parameter, notice that now it's telling me that I'm in the text parameter. <laughs> so basically, it goes ahead and tells me this is my title. Oh, God, I cannot spell. And then I need my options. Now, notice that when I switch to options, my message here switched. And it tells me that I could use the T for timeout. I could use these numbers for confirm and cancel. And again, I save myself a trip to the help file when I have the IntelliSense right in front of me. Um, this is what uh, the three things are. The lecture is the whole thing that does all these. The autocomplete as allows you to you know, go ahead and choose an option very quickly. And after that, the IntelliSense tells you where you're at, gives you some options on it. And other things, there are other very complex stuff that a lexer does, like for example, semantic lexing, which means that it detects whether you created a class and it doesn't matter where you mention that class, it will always have the same color, which in other lexers that doesn't happen. Like, and if it is a local variable, it doesn't use that variable outside of the code. Um, it doesn't give you that variable as an option uh, to autocomplete if you are not in the scope of that particular variable. So that's actually a little bit advanced. And the version one lexer, at least in VS code, doesn't have any of that. The version two one is extremely good at all of that. And it makes coding a little bit you know, easier. Oh, I think you're muted, Joe. You're muted. Thank you. Uh, let's start talking through now. W which ones do we we all we all voted, right? But um, I'd say you know when you're when you're new to Auto Hockey, site for Auto Hockey, and I'd put Notepad plus plus up with it. I just prefer site for Auto Hockey. It has the debugger built in and and some other stuff. But I know there's some amazing extensions for Notepad plus plus. Um, after you're you're starting to learn uh, Auto Hockey and you get a more Studio is amazing, but it does have a learning curve, right? Mace Spirit, which he'll be the first to admit, he, he hates toolbars. What's that, Chad? Oh, I'm just a bastard. I, I... <laughs> I've just never made anything. I mean, I know how to use it. And honestly, I wrote Studio for me. And I published it because it made my life easier. So I was just yeah. like, eh, somebody else might use it. Never, you know, never thinking that, oh, they might want some documentation or <laughs> they might want, you know, to understand how anything works and any, you know, functionality. I want to add some things. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you can uh, actually do that. Um, Auto Hockey Studio actually has a com object that you can link into and use and add all sorts of fun things to it if you want. It's just, you know, not documented and it's a pain in the ass. So <laughs> well, but, you said also, Chad, you're not planning to update it to version two. Is that right? Uh, I have no plans, unfortunately. No, I'm so busy now. I just it's ridiculous. I just don't have the time. Um maybe and we don't have to decide this now, but um 
I was thinking maybe we could plan a, a call mm -hmm. where you help us look at it and maybe we'll at least make a couple tweaks where we can launch version two code from it because uh, that would be very convenient. Well, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's not that difficult. <laughs> Just write a, uh, let's see, what would you need to do? Just basically tell it what or uh, where you want to launch the code, what exe you want to launch the code from, and point to it. That's about it. Yeah. So, so those of you who don't know, and this is you know, Maestro of Chad here. Um, it Auto Hockey Studio is written in Auto Hockey. Now it uses the Scintilla DLL, right? Yep. Yeah, the Scintilla Lexer, and well, I wrote the Lexer, and um, but yeah, it just uses the Scintilla DLL to. Uh, basically format the text to make it look all pretty. Yeah. So it's written in and for auto hotkey, which is, you know, that's why, and, it, and it's got a lot of crazy bells and whistles. I have a really long, it's like an hour and 40 minutes long. Of, I think actually Chad, it's our first talk we ever had. Probably. We, hey, let me show you some stuff. And so we got on, <laughs> I don't know if it was Zoom, it was Hangouts, I think at the time. I don't know, it was a long time ago. Yeah. And you, I said, well, how do you do this? How do you do this? And how do you do this? And a couple of things you couldn't do. And you're like, well, give me five minutes. And then you added it, you know, into it. So yeah, anyway, it's a, it's a solid editor. It, it does have a learning curve, but um, it, it's got, it, you can be very efficient in it. Let's put it that way. If you start learning it, um, if you've no. watched videos with Isaiah's with his, where this is where when you're working with multiple people or you're working with code that you're going to um, distribute to other people and have different versions of it, Git integration becomes almost a requirement, right? And that's where um, VS Code with its Git integration. Right now, that that's mainly what is making everybody, you know, gravitate towards it. Um, I remember, so when I started back in the day, I started with Notepad++, I figured out about Scintilla, the Scintilla controller. Um, they didn't have a Lexer for auto hotkey at that time. So I built the first auto hotkey Lexer for Notepad++, which is the one that I actually shipped in this Scintilla component. And I created a Scintilla wrapper for it all of that just to try to get Lexing on Notepad++. And then if I could have just shared that code with other people who can help me out, um, you know, probably that would have gotten a little bit more traction. But at that time, I didn't understand Git. I didn't know it. Now I understand it. And now I see like, holy crap, this right now, that's the reason why everybody is using, most of the people are using uh, VS code, because oh. now I can just push a button and you have my code and you make a change and push a button and I have your code now. Isaiah, open up Chrome or whatever browser you want and show show them the other holy hell moments. <laughs> you can navigate somewhere and have VS code even if you don't have VS code. Right. There's two two points on that. If you want to give it a try and you don't want to install it, you can go to vscode.dev, which is an instance of VS Code on the web. And the good thing about it is that it's it has it is almost as if you had it on your uh oh. Did we lose them? I think we did. His internet, well, it, it's that one usually is just his internet bugged out. But what he was going to say was you have almost all the functionality of what you have if you have the editor installed. Um, it's not quite, it's not personalized. But if you're logged in, like you can see in the top right of his screen, it, he's logged in. And so it will actually remember some of your settings. Uh, it's still not the same thing as having VS Code installed, but it's amazing at, at how, oh, looks like it's coming back, um, uh, how powerful it is for a browser tool like it's it's crazy you back gotta unmute him i guess yeah well i'm gonna leave him muted this time hey <laughs> yeah yeah let me go back my internet kind of like had a little bit of a glitch there so what i was showing was that you could go to the scode.dev you have an instance of VS Code and you can actually use extensions. The only difference might be that some hotkeys might not work because there are some hotkeys that are assigned to the browser itself. 
so you cannot use those. But everything else actually works basically the same. And actually, most of the hotkeys are exactly the same. To save is Control S, Open. Everything else is going to work just the same. The other way that you can access VS Code online is going to GitHub. I'm basically just opening any repository from anybody. Just go to any repository. And if you're in the code page like this, and you hit your period key, it would go ahead and grab that particular repository, the whole thing, open a new instance of Git, uh, well, sorry, of VS Code. And now you can just go ahead and, let me go ahead because I have this tree open. Now you can modify their code, okay? Save it. And you can actually send the code back to them as a pull request so that they decide whether they want to merge your code. So you, you don't even need to have VS Code in your computer at all, ever. <laughs> yeah. so, which is actually, if you want to test it and you don't want to download it, you don't want to install it, yeah, no worries. You can just go ahead and test it online. It's not a problem. I was gonna say, I'll put the link here. We, we did a video tutorial exactly how to go through that process the other day, just because yeah. I was like, damn, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to someone's Git cloned it downloaded it in you know I'll, I'll tweak it but i didn't know how to ever suggest changes back and so isaiah walked us through how simple it is to to be able to push back changes to the author um, right now it is a process because usually as i as i described in the video um this type of things is meant for teamwork and usually this pushing and accepting changes usually is divided into somebody who accepts the change and somebody who commits the change. So there's a few steps to go through, but they're very simple to follow. They're not that difficult to go ahead and understand. Now, well, ahead. I was going to say also, so we let's talk a little bit about what what you can do in, in at least the main, I'd say, Studio, Cypher Auto Hotkey, Notepad++, VS Code. Um, we'll throw in Code Quick Tester. Right. I, I, would, I would actually basically set the question to why should I use an IDE and not any other kind of like editor? Yeah. So the main idea is that editors that are just for coding, they have some features like debugging code, like stepping through code, which allows me to go line by line in my program and see exactly what it's doing and what the variables have inside. That is one of the things that you can do. Um, it can give you stack information. Um, for those who do not know what the stack is, um, we should kind of like do a video on that at some point, but basically- I've done debugging videos where I-, I Okay, there straight. you go. Very good, very good. So maybe uh, you can watch that video and, and get a, a little sense of what the stack is. But an IDE that is for development will give you access to those things in a very easy manner. So that's great. And the debugging window, by the way. Um, so the difference between those tools uh, is how the IntelliSense is done, how the debugging is done, whether you have access to extensions and plugins, um, if they have Git integration or file comparison, all those little features vary from one IDE to another. And that's just then a matter of preference. If you want to have all those tools available, well, there are some IDEs for that. If you just want it simple and not obstructive, then there are other IDEs for that. So it's just a matter of preference. Which we do. Well, there's a couple other things as well. Um... I think, we lost. I think he's gone again. Yeah. Uh, the uh, it, it, this is the this is one of the things that made me switch from site to studio was the multi line typing. You know, and in site for auto hockey, you can do multi line straight up and down in a vertical, but you can't have those things not lined up. And boy, I've watched both Maestrieth and Azalea's do some crazy multi line typing, and it's just so powerful once you get used to it. It's it's a gotta have once you start using something like that. Um, and, and here's the thing also is, it's not just for programming. Like often you'll be doing something in other tools and realize you got some crazy text manipulation to do and you'll bring it into you know a, a solid editor or IDE, I should say. And 
you know, take advantage of the multi-line typing, which, cause it's just a huge, huge help. That's what I use studio for nowadays is pretty much just grabbing text and just quickly making multiple changes. Like if you're going from one type of format to another, like if you've got an object or something like that, that you need to just slightly tweak something, but over multiple lines, like adding double quotes or adding... Jack, you want to you share your screen and just show? Because I, I know for you, it's it's second nature. Um. <laughs> uh, let's see. Just trying to think of... I'll just make up some text. Yeah, I'm just... Uh, let's see, what would I... Uh, something and, and what i'll say also with site for auto hotkey you can do regular expressions in it but it's just a little different you know you have to adapt it to how they implemented it so it's one of the things i don't like about it but it, you, you can still do them oh yep. sure absolutely so say i want to wrap interesting with quotes for whatever reason so are i could just run to the quick find you're not sharing your screen are you i thought i was all right what did i do uh, who knows? Uh, hit the button. Yeah. How about now? Yep. Okay. Let's get this out of the way because Zoom is a pain in the butt. There we go. All right. So I just run to the quick find and int dot star g. Sure. Can you zoom in a little? Oh, yeah. Sure. Just for some of us. Oh, did you upgrade to Windows 11? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So I've got the ability to use regex search and everything. And so let me get actually, there we go. So I select, and the fun thing about Studio is once you've selected everything, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It actually selects everything and everything can be typed. So if I wanna change something, I hit the escape key um, and type good. Instead of interesting, then I hit shift, double do, hit the double quotes, and I've replaced a whole bunch of interesting with good double quotes around it in a few keystrokes rather than having to do the find replace, the that or all the other. And then if I want to change it again, I just look for quote, good quote, and then change it to interesting again or whatever. And it's just so fast and convenient you don't have to think you just do and then also i have to where if you hit uh control f1 now everything's purple and then if i want to look for uh oh. yeah of course it's going to be a pain in the butt do, 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 do. So you're limiting the search right yeah, now. Yeah, limiting the search for INT. I, that's one of the things that I do not like about VS Code. VS Code allows you to limit the search, but it's really quirky and it's really annoying. <laughs> I can tell you, like, I that's one of the things that I, every time I have to do this, what he just did, I get like, oh no, so annoying. Yeah, I just, Oh, I just can't stand stuff like that. Um, also, there's fun so, little ways. Oh, go ahead. While we're here, though, um, the fact that see how something is underlined and it's underlined everywhere. This oh, is yeah. my butt several times where I'll type a variable name and I know I referenced it somewhere else, but it's not underlined. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> this thing, because if it's if it's if you have a word that type a word that's only there once, Chad, somewhere. Uh, come on fingers there you go so notice he's in there but it's not underlined that means there's no other place where that word is in this file and so just mm -hmm. little things like that in, in when we're highlighting studio here but when you're choosing an editor these little things can really help you out absolutely it automatically tells you that there are, that this particular word that's not the only time that you have typed it yeah, so, right yeah and actually i don't know because write it again but capitalized oh it will yeah i know yours does but um isaias will vs code do those is, is that like um sensitive? yeah let me double check what i i know that it actually tells you when you have 
selected the same option. So just go ahead and open up here. So when you put your mouse on a word, let me make it bigger. If you put your mouse on the word, it actually highlights them all. You cannot, it just makes a very faint little uh, square around it. Now, does it mean that it is case sensitive? Not exactly, unless I make it to. So I think there is a way for me. So whenever I'm doing the find, if I I can change some options for it to not be case sensitive. Yeah, but if if you had Bob uppercase and Bob lowercase. No, so this is what I mean. So this one is lowercase e, and this one is uppercase e, and that one is not being highlighted because right. this one. So it is actually case sensitive in this sense, but I think you can actually modify that to make it. Well, so that I, I saw you were doing your search to modify it. I, I thought you were saying oh, that. No, 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 no. So in the search, you do have some options regarding right. case sensitivity. Right. And I was saying like, probably you can do something similar to that. Now, so for right now, if I do a search, it will highlight all of them unless I actually specify that is case sensitive, in which case we'll do that. But for the highlighting while I'm actually in it, by default, it doesn't do that. You have to actually and, kind of like. Say, and what if it's a unique word? Will it? Is there any indication that it's not anywhere else? Yeah. It, no, there is no indication. You just put the mouse on top of it, and it's just going to highlight that one. But here's the thing: regarding his, uh, regarding knowing where it is, I never look at this on my screen here. I look at it on my right side, so it actually shows me locations where that same word might be present. So I could just scroll over. Yeah, you'd have to be looking for that. No, so basically, uh, after a while, I got used to it. And if I'm looking for that, I just put my mouse and know where they are. Um, if it is this one that is, doesn't show up anywhere, it's just one location. I don't have any other indication that that word is anywhere else. So right. it's kind of like a very quick way of knowing that if I needed to. Yeah, unfortunately, Scintilla, I don't believe, has the uh, facility to do stuff like that. In your case, it looks like your editor automatically selects everything. Is that when you search or is that somewhere else? Because well, the underline is not showing that it's selected. It's just showing duplicates. Uh-huh. Okay. But in general, for in my case, I would have to hit a hotkey for it to select everything at once. It's not like selected by default, is what I'm trying to say. Right, right. right. Yeah, okay, it's not okay. selected. You ah, okay. What I would, I have the ability. So if you select the word and then you hit control A, it will select all of those. Oh, all of that those particular. Oh, words. right. That is interesting. In here, I have to, I, I have a hotkey for that. Right. <laughs> and then I have to be careful because you would find it everywhere. Right. Not an exact match. And that's the reason why I, I usually have to kind of like select exactly what I want to match. And if it is not unique, then I have to make it unique in some sense, you know, to make sure that I select exactly what I want. So really complicated. I don't know if you saw TN's question as they asked, but he was wondering if, if there's a way to get the VS Code debugger to go peek inside an auto hockey object structure deeper than three layers. And Chad, I'd say to you, do you know, is there a limit on studio how deep it goes? I deeper have no layers. idea. Let me double check on that because actually, uh, if I have a hub, uh, so let me see. I'm going to do it right there. It's just a function definition. So I have an object, let's say um, object, which will have an up, uh, well, my layer one will contain an object, which will contain layer two, which will contain an object that has a variable that is named something. That's what you're referring to, right? Layered object. So what I want to do is just uh, put a slip here. And this I'm just going to make it so that I could stop right here. And now that I have that, here on the left, I have access to all my variables and stuff, which is what we were referring to um, before. Now, here's where I could just go ahead and take a peek at all my objects and stuff. And here's the one that I have. So I have layer one, uh, layer two, and I have my variable up here. I don't, I, I, I haven't deeper than three. Let's go ahead and add another one. So let's. How are you going to do that? 
player three. <laughs> and let's go one more, level four. Yeah, why not? Let's test another one, level five. There you go. So this is gonna be an object here. There you go. So I have a multi-layer. Oh, by the way, that color, the the parade. The, bra the brick, the yeah. brackets. Does do yeah. you like it? Yeah, it's very good. Actually, it helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it helps a lot know where the heck you are in the, um, so I cannot live without one without that one. Level one, two, three, four. Wow. I, 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 I have never yes. I have never actually had any actually not only that, I could see what the base of the object was. Now I have a base object here, and that object is his its base is the any object. I could see the original object that created all the objects. So uh, yeah, I have never encountered any issues with what I, what you will have an, an issue with. I don't know. Now let me confirm something because this might be confusing. The reason why you might have kind of like a limit is that if you installed Auto Hotkey Plus Plus, it installs its own debugger. It has a debugger for itself. That debugger is limited. It doesn't have many things. I installed an additional debugger called VS Code Auto Hotkey Debug. It's annoying. It has a few things that I don't like. I understand why he made the decision, but it's extremely powerful. You can see everything. It works for version one and version two, and it can pick up inside almost anything. So I didn't, I have never hit the uh, issue that you were referring to. Did, uh, did so, you yeah. this chat? In that case, the limitation is inheritance structure only visible plus two layers deep. Inheritance. Oh, maybe. Maybe it has to do with inheritance. So I don't know if I'm going to go ahead and or, um, do a specific ah, example right. now because it's going to take a little bit longer. Right. But in general, we can go with other questions. And later on, I will, maybe we can make a video on that. The, but the, um, they're, they're, like I said, these are both very solid editors, right? They, yeah. they can do crazy stuff. And because we spend so much time in these things, it's worth learning. Like, actually, I, I created a, a download for each of those tools and for Cypher Auto Hotkey and I think Notepad to print out the hotkeys because there's so many. And VS Code, like, can you, can you show, say, how they, they combine like double? Hot you oh know, key, like it's ludicrous. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, cool. Is this yours, Chad? Yeah. Yeah, yes. So Chad is actually sharing there. Yeah. So you can step through and the debug debugging is really powerful. I don't use it nearly enough, uh, but it, it is super powerful. There you go. Now the thing is, and what you were explaining is uh regarding the hotkeys that you can access with this tool. Now uh VS code goes above and beyond regarding uh, if you can create hotkeys or not. And there's so many hotkeys that you can set up. Not only you can set hotkeys, is that you can then set conditions as to when that particular hotkey will be activated. So you can have the same key, so the, the skate key, so right? They have kind of, specific context that you can set for that hotkey. That's one. And second of all, there's this thing about cording two hotkeys one after the other. So you have to press control uh, semicolon control X to get a cancel run, for example. And and I do that with my um, open folder, I think it is, or workspace. I have it like alt tick alt O. What I think about that is kind of like switching my hot my my whole keyboard layout. If I press Alt Tick, if I press Alt Back Tick, my whole keyboard layout changes to a different keyboard uh, section of hot hotkeys. So you can group stuff together like Control K, Control O, and those kind of things. It makes it a little bit more complex, but it gives you a little bit of flexibility in the terms of having the same hot key in different situations. I actually uh, don't use not even half of the power of using the hot keys in here because there are so many things you can do with it. So, yeah. 
Yeah, which actually we inadvertently you you demonstrated one of the other things I was going to ask you to do is to show you have a search for finding your hotkeys, right? And oh yeah, sure. Also has a way that you can search because we all know trying to find you know going through the menu bars and stuff to find your hotkey sucks and it's ridiculous. Right. That this isn't in every tool that we have in every program, right? Yeah. Like, why can't I just search? Same with the options. This thing has way too many options, way too many features. Every single thing in here has a list of things that you can modify. So searching for, you know, sections allow you to quickly modify whatever you're looking for. Um, so the yeah, those search bars are time savers for sure. And then we now, actually Go ahead, Chad. I was just gonna say I've just got little pop-ups that come up and show what. Uh, oh, I guess I could share my screen. Yeah. Yep. Sure. So if I want to open something, uh, Alt M brings up the Omni search, and then if you remove the Omni or remove the uh, oh, Alt right. text, it'll show you what prefixes will search for what things so if i want to look for a menu item i hit that and then open control o is my hot key it shows that it's a menu item and then it shows what it does yep and it goes through the list it's not as pretty as any of the other ones but i've never been uh i've never been really uh, you know what? chad um bring that back up because i don't know i'm sorry i wasn't listening to everything you said did you mention that you can search off like the initials of things oh right yeah it's it's uh fuzzy logic for um so if i want to look for um uh for update what's that check for update yeah cfu for check for update yeah. or if you want to do c k f u o o d or yeah do so what's amazing about the and, and i mean it's awesome it's in the studio i'm just commenting more as a programmer right why when we have searches why are they first off limited to just an exact match right why aren't they fuzzy and then chad has actually built it where it waits off the first letters off the words so right. that's why we're using those letters to think of the first letter of each word and they have a higher scoring in his algorithm and so they bubble up faster, which I think is just freaking brilliant. Yeah, it is. It's actually very a very good algorithm for that. Now, um, all of those options, again, even though some people might consider them like just adding a little bit of sugar to the thing, they become almost part of what we do because you do this so often that later on you cannot live with it. Uh, there's a few things that uh, I got from using editors that then when I'm going to Chrome and I try to select a word and put the quotation marks around it automatically, it doesn't work. And I'm like, dude, this should be well, standard everywhere. I hated studio at first because it automatically closes your dump. You can turn it off. Right. But yeah. now I go to other editors and, and I get messed up because they don't have that, you know, yeah. <laughs> that show also how you can easily break that function and move it into its own include, and it automatically writes the include for you. So let's go ahead and... So he has a hotkey, you hit it, it takes the function you're in, and basically suggests that like the name of the function is the file, but refers to it, and then when mm -hmm. you also have a, what's it called, the publish? It'll yeah. automatically go pull all of those, push them back into the main script. That's if you want to put it like to a Git or a Gist or whatever, right? And share it with people. Right. That is right. One file. But like that functionality, I, I know when I was talking to Jean years ago, like he he has it all in one file. And I'm like, oh my God, I would go insane with that. Um, but Studio makes it easy to break out your files into other folders, you know, or other, other files, your function, other files, and then later pull them back in if you want to. Yeah, it automatically too. searches in there too because it's it's got the include when you're looking for it right and so if i want to the another function it'll bring it in it'll automatically show the um oh the intellisense for so for another thing comma 
and then it'll automatically jump to show you where you are within that particular call to that function. So, and if you go too far, it'll change everything red. So if you put more than what the function requires, then it's like, hey, dude, you went outside, so back it up. Okay, cool. <laughs> and it works with all of the stuff. In the chat, show them also, if you wanted to add another control to the another you know um, screen in front of you, right? Like it's so easy. You right click and say split where you want it. Uh, and I remember when you were redoing Studio and you're like you were you were showing this off, and I was just in my brain I was thinking through what you had to do to solve this kind of stuff, and I'm, my head just really hurt thinking. About that. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it was a lot of stuff to go through here. So this one here. Let's say I want to have, so Alt-J jump to, well, actually I should, uh, uh, OSD. So there we go, file search, Alt-J shows up down there. So uh, I can go to another function so I can have my other function, which is the include over here. So I can say, oh yeah, that's what this does. Or if I need to edit this quickly, I could just jump from one to the other, I think it's, alt space, then you can jump between which one has focus, um, alt space, uh, demo. So I'm back over here, all without having to take my hand off my keyboard to Which actually. Is, yeah, that's that's one of the biggest issue, the biggest things with editors. And they try to make this as comfortable as possible to allow you to not remove your hands from the keyboard as right. much as you can. That's because when you're whole... coding, you're not trying to go ahead and use the mouse as often, right? Oh, so it's, and I designed Studio to be as keyboard driven as possible, just because it's ridiculous to pick up your mouse and do this and do that, run over here, run over there. Yep. Just keep your hands on your keyboard, use your shortcuts, and everything will be okay. <laughs> that is right. Then, Kat, how, I'm just curious. I don't know if it's simple enough you can explain it. I know in Studio, when you're down within an, a file that's included, you can hit run on the thing, and it actually figures out what program you're trying. It goes to your... the, the Yeah, the main program, so yeah. that... So that if you're, well, let's get rid of this one here, remove control. So if I'm in, in here and I hit run, it's going to automatically go to the main, the main program wow. and run yeah, that yeah. main program so that you don't have to go back to your main program and run it or anything. Is else. there a way for you to kind of like force it to run the one that is open? Um, well, the only thing is, is like, if you're in a function, that's not going to do a whole hell of a lot, but you could, I mean, um rst run selected text it's not going to do anything no, exactly no 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 but what i meant is for example i usually have a, a, a say for example i'm creating a function right here in this same file i make some tests and i don't want to run my main script i just want to run this file that has the test that i want to run um i don't know if it would run this same so just up up bef uh, like right on top of that so on top of the declaration of the function, uh huh, yeah, just call the function. Oh, okay, I see what you then mean. Just call it right here in this file. Yeah, just go ahead and call it. Yeah, just call it with something there. Yeah, just, just go ahead and see. Can you run that? Okay, exactly. So that you can actually. It's not that it's always forcing you to run the main file. You can actually right. use this one to test. Okay. Right. Well, you have to select it, of course, and then hit uh, Alt M R S T for run selected text, and or, then it just mm -hmm. runs the select. Or assign text. a hotkey to it, which I it's so easy to do, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just I've got so many oh. hotkeys. It's just you know something <laughs> like one more. What's so, up? So, Chad, uh, and I'm curious, um, Isaiah. I don't know if, if VS Code does this. In Studio, you can create. Um, there's the what are they called? There's the personal variables, and then there's the like hot strings on crack kind of thing where you're you're <laughs> nesting the, the things. Remember what I'm talking about? You have like your A, B, and C, and then C, D, and E. Oh, and yeah, yeah, A, B. Okay, yeah. So R, S. Those are snippets. Yeah. Um, 
but they're built where they can pipe in things automatically which is that's the crazy part to me right so what i do is like say i've got um oh www is a good one yeah. all right so i come down here as www space all right so i've got a big Oh, he muted Maybe, himself. Yeah, yeah, he probably yeah, muted yeah. himself. Was it? You still there? Or his connection dropped. String. It's a while string. So I've got. All right. Uh, you were muted there for a second or am something. Am I here? You're, you are yeah. now. Okay. Yeah, you're back. Cool. So if I put in www hit space, well, of course it's gonna really hit a new line. Yeah. Oh, it might. Oh, because it's still up. Uh -huh. Ah, nice. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So this is the string that I want to put in. And then I've got anything with a dollar sign before it, it's going to come up and ask me, all right, node, what is the node I want to, um, I want to mm -hmm. put in there. So yep. ABC, sure, whatever. Now OBJ, that's my object, um, my OBJ. And then it's going to take and replace everything yep with what I need in there. So this string here is ready to go. So what this is basically for is um, actually this is most of the time what I use it for. Um, it's for looping over um, XML strings and everything else, but it just makes it so that if you've got things that you normally write, but have slight variances in them, you can go ahead and set it up to where all you have to do is put in a couple of letters and then change whatever it is that need to be needs to be changed in order for you to uh you know yeah so it, in. yeah so basically we do have that in um okay. yes code but in a different implementation of it it's not exactly the same so let me go ahead and um show this one here what you do, you have this, uh, let me just one second, let me make this one smaller. You have this section here uh, called uh, user snippets, right? And you can select them based on the language. So I can have a snippets just for Auto Hockey version one, just for Auto Hockey version two, or global ones that is for everybody. So I can have different ones. Now, if I go to one of them, um, this is just uh, JSON strings that you can uh, go ahead and uh, modify. Now, let me see this one that is the simple one. When I type dot file, it should give me the text. And here are the dollar signs that you were referring to. Now, instead of actually asking you about them, what it actually does is that when I do dollar file, it places my cursor on the first option. I type my option, whatever it is, my URL, URL to file, right? And then I hit tab and it jumps to the second one. Yeah, so, that's how most of them do it. Unfortunately, that is right. not real simple to do in- uh, It's not really simple, but basically what it's doing is that it creates kind of like a placeholder in which you can jump to right. by hitting tab. And depending on what you're doing, so some of them, if I have a menu, um, so I have a menu name or whatever it was, the other one, the progress, for the progress, it jumped already here to where the length is at because I'm expecting an object right there. Right. So I just say my object, hit tab, and it jumps exactly to where those little details are. So again, it's basically the same effect. The only thing is that it's implemented a little bit differently. Right. Yeah, I'm doing like the message bar, the input box. Right, exactly. Approach rather than having it just being smart. Uh, if you're using the Scintilla control, what you can do is that you can actually just place um, the text temporarily in the control, right? Uh -huh and get the position of where the dollar sign is at, right. and save that position, remove the dollar stuff, and next time when you hit tab, you just jump to that position. So probably that's what they do, what, how they do it. Probably. But, right, but basically it's just about saving the position of the dollar sign in the control before we go ahead and right. um, different. I'm not that fancy. <laughs> I'm just 
everything I do is simple as I can get it done and <laughs> yeah. still be convenient. Yeah. And that was the best and the only way I figured out. I was just like, you know what? Just make it, ask for what you need, and then just blurt out the blurt it out and be done with it once it's once you've gotten enough of the information. The the one thing I will let people be aware of is studio does not like hot strings. No. <laughs> you, you built a, a different way just because I annoyed you enough. Um, <laughs> have them, but yeah, or just use the personal variables, which which is another approach. Yeah, the personal right. variable list is always, it's just so helpful, especially if you've got things that you like to type that are really large or just things that you use all the time. So Alt-M, PVL for personal variable list. And I've got a list of all of the things that I normally use that way. I just don't have to type them all the time. Just drives me nuts. But are those like 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 snippets of code that you can just double click and it just grabs it? No, uh, what, what it is, is basically it's those words. So response text, there uh -huh. it is. Yeah, OK. Or um, select single node, just things that I don't want to type, yep. but it's yep. something yep. that I use all, all the time. Right. In, in, in VS Code, well, at least the lexers that we're using here, what they do is that as you type, it grabs the contents of the whole control, right. and it starts creating an index of it, mm -hmm. and it, it actually suggests you everything from yeah, variables to text to... But you can decide whether you want to be uh, uh, suggested all or like, for example, from comments, from text, from variables, or if you want to disable some of them, I don't want to be suggested anything that has to do with variables or, you right. Know, you can choose. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, I don't have it that granular, but any word that appears within the current file that you have will come up as an autocomplete as well. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Yeah, and as I think you mentioned it earlier of, Boy, it's the one thing I th wish site had. Would you? There is a, an extension or a plugin you can have that sort of does it, but it really slows site down for whatever reason. Mm. That offering up of other variable names that you have in your yeah. file really, really helpful. That is right. Yeah, I just I got tired of having to type the same things over and over and over again, and it's just like you know what? <laughs> Why don't I just write it to where it goes in and every well, every time you hit enter, it re-indexes the entire file and goes through and figures out what letter, you know, what words are longer than two characters and stores those. It's you know, just a lot of background code, but yep. it's fun and it definitely saves a lot of time. So it was worthwhile. So I did it. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else have any other editor comments before we, I guess we went long, whatever, but um I think it was some really good having a solid editor. I can't tell you of you know how important that is, right? Hopefully you guys realize this, but oh, people yeah. do often think, oh, I'll just use Notepad, you know, the straight up Notepad. It's like, <laughs> oh my word, you know. Uh, but then, then you mentioned something that it might happen, which is you get used to getting everything suggested, so you forget a lot of stuff. And then there's the that one time that you have to use Notepad, even if you don't want to, and you don't remember anything. For that matter, you know, when I go to a computer that's not mine and doesn't have auto hotkey installed, I'm useless. Now, this is the other thing. VS Code has this thing that you can connect to your GitHub account and all your settings, all your profiles, all your extensions get saved in the cloud so if you go to another computer, you just connect to your connect, and all your settings go back to you and you don't have to worry about it anymore. So that's a that's a plus, at least in that sense, that now I don't have to worry about, oh, my hotkeys are different now. No, I, whenever I could just have to log into my account, that's it. Yeah, I think with Studio, you just copy over the settings file and everything's there. <laughs> well, exactly. Studio's what a couple megs um in vs code is it's 300 yeah you remember it was a, like a huge <laughs> oh um studio is only like 300k well i meant with when you have everything and other stuff it's it, but anyway fine fair enough it's it's tiny yeah yeah but you do have to have 
you know, a thumb drive or something with you or have it sure. in where you can go grab it. Either that or just to periodically or save it onto Dropbox or whatever. Right. Save Studio onto a Dropbox folder. And then as long as you have Dropbox everywhere, you just go to that folder and run it. It runs yep. from Which, wherever it is. So it actually, and, and we didn't bring this up earlier, but um, Studio, you do need the DLL, right? But it's an auto hockey script. And that's where if you can't install an executable, again, if you already have auto hotkey there, you can run it, which is really handy. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. Yeah, it's silly. But, you know. All right, well, let's, uh, is there any other, any other, anyone want to talk about anything else besides editors? Do you have any, and you want to know how to do something in a given editor? Then we got experts from every editor in the world here. So, <laughs> has anyone changed their minds of like they're going to make a switch? How to store VS Code settings in the cloud? Yes. Um, let me. Let me Don't you ahead. just log in and it automatically saves it? Yeah, but that's the point. He was, he wants to know where I would do that. So basically, here on the top, uh, on the bottom left, you have the option to connect to an account uh, at the beginning it's not going to show up your name there it's just going to allow you to turn on settings um, and then it's just going to allow you to it's going to ask you how do you want to connect to it you can use the github account and i think your microsoft account if you have a microsoft account you can use that so yep. after you do that it would start syncing and you can uh, decide what can be synced and what will not be synced. So if there are some settings, and actually you can do this by setting, there are some settings that you can decide to say, um, I don't want to sync it. If there's something that you don't care about syncing it to the cloud, you can just remove the syncing for that particular setting. So it is extremely granular as to what you can do with it. So. Oh, absolutely. Yep. And uh, I, I saw, I forget where I saw it or I'd bring it up. I saw uh some sort of a survey or study done the other day about you know common IDEs and editors and VS Code is just dominating. It's it's crazy how strong it is um, become. <laughs> yeah, had had there been other editors out there that I knew about other than Notepad because that's what I started with, I would have never wrote Studio. <laughs> yeah, that can happen. No, but here's the thing. Uh, somebody is asking, besides syntax highlighting, are there any plugins or tips for using Notepad++ as the IDE? And actually, there's one thing, and I mentioned this to Joe recently, there was one plugin in Notepad++ that even to this day, when I am using VS Code, I'm still missing it. I said, like, I need that. <laughs> and I remember that it was called TextFX. So let me type a TextFX. And I think one of the reasons why people now Notepad plus plus was like the the default editor for coders be, before Sublime and stuff like that. So Notepad plus plus was the IDE in Windows for a little while, um, but people started migrating because the development didn't go well. This particular plugin that I just mentioned, Text Effects allowed you to manipulate the text in your in your editor based on whatever you have on the clipboard. Like for example, I could select a lot of lines and align them based on something that I had on, on the clipboard. So it was, uh, or move the locations of lines, duplicate stuff. So it was text manipulation at its best. And I still haven't found any editor that has all those options. They have most of them now, but there's still a few things that I'm missing and I haven't found a, a plugin that actually matches that. The only problem with that plugin is that I think it's only for 32-bit. I don't think uh, they have a 64-bit version of it. So you have to download Notepad++ in 32-bit to be able to access it. That's the only thing. Awesome. All right. Well, we're ending on the half hour here. Let me hit stop and we'll start our next conversation, which is uh, our last one before we're kind of done is on data structures. Yeah. There you go. Recording.